Hello, this is Mark Boyer, and this is a short informative video uh, called Part 2 on our BC MMAR program. Um, part 1, you should go look at, okay? Uh, basically, what we're doing is uh, in BC, uh, through our Quadra Electoral District Association of the Marijuana Party of Canada, we are drafting uh, the articles for taking over the MMAR program in BC. Uh, now, basically, the articles of the MMAR program are reside in Ottawa, and technically they're not there. Okay, we suspect they're in France. Okay, but each province has their own set of articles. Okay where all the case law precedences and all the rulings and all the, par the, the paperwork of administering the MMAR program for this province, and it's like the same in every other province, okay? We can come to the BC courts, which we do through courtesy notices to the Attorney General, to the City Mayor, to the Fire Department, to the Police Department, to the Attorney General of Canada, the Health Canada, to all these different people, we file a courtesy notice saying that we have the due right to take over the program in BC, which is what we're doing. Okay? And if, they'll, if they object, we'll end up in court. That's all. Chances of them objecting? Slim. Okay? Because we're offering a better program. Okay, and if we don't offer a better program, then get out of the picture. Okay, the new MMPR program is being promoted as what's necessary to fix all the problems of the MMAR program, which is not functioning as Health Canada desired it to do. And that's why they turned in the articles. Now, we're picking up the articles for BC. Okay, and it's not wise to do this across the whole country, but then some a marijuana party EDA in Alberta could grab the articles for Alberta, and a marijuana party EDA in Ontario could grab the articles for Ontario, likewise across the province in Quebec, same way. Now, with these articles, okay, and I'll use BC as the prime example, and it's very close in Toronto, okay. We've permitted compassion clubs, or the authorities have allowed or permitted compassion clubs under UCC rulings as cantons. Okay? Now, there's been all kinds of great court cases in BC that we can cherry pick and approach the courts and say, under the court rulings in BC that have been placed in estoppel, which is hung, hung up to dry. It's a legal term, okay? As if floating on air. Estoppel. Okay? So these course card cases that should be case precedent. And common law is all about case law precedent, okay? So basically, by cherry picking with the crown the cases that are pertinent to administrating uh, a properly run program can be done. Okay? And it's basically you're coming to the courts and telling them they can take their power back, which Health Canada has usurped from them across the last 25 years. Chunk by chunk by chunk by chunk. And the provinces can and should take it back. Okay? And this is the offer we're making. Now, you do this through courtesy notices. You file courtesy notices. Okay? Now, with the clubs... There's two ways. Compassion clubs need to protect their suppliers. That's a really big issue right now. And I'm the first to admit that most of my video and what I'm presenting here is shop talk for growers and cannabis providers, dispensaries. Okay? The reality is, is uh, what you have to do, or for the dispensaries to work, they, they need to stop being a not-for-profit society and open a co-op. It's virtually identical paperwork. And the paperwork to do it is to change over is really simple. 
And it's really seamless. It's very easy to do. Now, what we're doing is setting up a two-prong BC MMAR program that any EDA can join. Okay. The EDA that holds the MMAR program technically will not have a compassion club or a uh, dispensary or a grow up directly under its EDA. Its sole function is as an office to operate the Logenics computer that runs the MMAR program for us. Okay. Now, in BC, Let's look at it from a patient's point of view, okay? In BC, there are 1,500, 2,000 legitimate MMAR license card holders who have a right to grow or, you know, designate a grower in this province, okay? And there's at least 25, 30,000 people who are members of compassion clubs and the police through UCC rules and regulations are not busting. So the reality is, is our BC MMAR card, MMAR card is going to be a card that everyone who is a member of these compassion clubs will have. Okay. Period. Okay. Now collectively, uh, where, where we're going with this is, Every member, okay, uh, let's say take a club of 3,000 members, very common, okay? A club with 3,000 members has a need, I could go through the math and everything, but, but, but because every patient that we enter into the program will be given a new card on a computer program readout, and where it says, how much pot do you use? We'll fill in realistic numbers. And... That number becomes a collective number times 3,000 people. And it gives you a very accurate number of how much inventory you need. Now, these clubs know how much inventory they've been going through. And this number here will reflect how much they're buying. Now, the number of pounds that they're buying to supply 3,000 members will equal at least 200 lights. Okay? at least 200 lights are going to be necessary to provide for those people for their needs uh, at the grow up end, okay? Now, with that ability for the Compassion Club to say, see, we have this tradition of supplying from this guy and uh, we can give him a certificate for him having a real reason for having 40 lights. And then they go to another grower and say, well, you have, because of our past history, you have a legitimate need for 25 lights. And this guy here has a legitimate need for eight lights. And this guy has a legitimate need for this light. Now, and this way, the growers are protected that their pot is actually going to a legitimate source. And the growers should be operating under a co-op. Okay, as opposed to a uh, society, not-for-profit society. And technically, under the MMPR program, they use the word cooperative. They don't use the word society. They use actually use the word cooperative. It's a far better way to operate. And there's five, six different platforms to operate a co-op. And operating the grower's end, like a wheat pool co-op, is the most logical one. But if... Other models of, of, of the Co-op Act apply to you. That's what it's for. It's to coordinate the activities of uh, like-minded uh, people with the same political purpose. Okay, And a co-op can be political. A Societies Act cannot be political. But a co-op is definitely political. You can actually run your EDA with the paperwork of a co-op and be fully compliant to Elections Canada. Now, shop talk. Okay, the marijuana party, a key element of our grow up co op and marijuana party dispensaries is that we charge 10% party sales tax. 
That's what the long way loophole allows or permits. Okay. Now, this here is a flat fee that we charge and add. It's built into the price of the pot. Okay. You technically don't see it. Now, when the member members are going to have to be or are going to be buying with their MMAR card. Okay, we're issuing them a magnetic strip card that has the information. All their vital statistics are on, going to be on the card. Now, what they do is they come up to the cashier at a compassion club and they load the card with X number of dollars. Let's say $100. Okay. They walk into the club. Now, that's called uh, an ORR transaction. And the person who took the $100 is entitled to 2%. That's law. That's standard business practice. Okay? Now, when they take that card and go in the back room and they buy their pot, that card will be deducted. Okay? And the Compassion Club, whoever did the sale, gets a 2% ORR. Okay, 2% of the total sale that went out on that card. Okay, so basically from the word jump, we're sharing 4 of the 10% with the Compassion Clubs. And that 4% goes a long way toward the administrating costs of everything. In fact, we say that 4% covers all administrating costs. Okay, that 6% we need to cover our administrating costs. And they're rather impressive what, what we need. Now, that's the basic there. Now, what's really critical about having a sales tax provision of percentage-wise like this, we can actually come up to the city and the province and say, would you like some percentage points built into this because of law enforcement issues, because of fire, you know, the costs that incurred to the city, the costs incurred to this, and we can add 5% for the city. No, another 5% to the province. And that way, they're sharing a lot, okay? We're, we're handing them real money, okay? And the city's benefiting, the province is benefiting, and this is an offer that's on the table, okay? By law, we can offer percentages because there's real costs involved to the police. There's real costs involved to the city. You know, all sorts of things that go on in the background that need to be dealt with and have financial costs and can be compensated with the use of our party sale, our PST. Okay? So, in law, the, the PST will be 10% from the party built in. And if the city requires another 5 and the state, uh, the province requires another 5, then it'll be a 20% party sales, a PST tax built in. But technically, it's not affecting the retail price of the pot. Okay? Regardless, the prices of marijuana are going to be dropping substantially under this program. Okay? Now, the party sales tax is essential because the number one crime out there when and if this MMPR program gets off the ground is going to be tax evasion. Okay? And a political party can protect its beliefs by collecting a party sales tax. So says a Longley loophole decision of 1999. Okay? It, it's a beautiful thing. It says there that we're allowed to collect 10, up to $10 billion worth of revenue or is it total sales? Uh, it's irrelevant. Okay? Uh, the only, up to $10 billion of revenue or total sales in order to protect our beliefs, which are the marijuana beliefs. We're using the long loophole to grab the MMAR program for BC. And basically, the only way we can do it is just give courtesy notices like we're doing. And if they object, they'll either come to talk to us and where we're going to offer them a slice of the pie. Okay? And it's important. Okay? Because nothing's free. Okay? And we are willing to work with the province and hand them back the power of uh, to defend the people here in BC, which has been raped by Health Canada. 
Okay. Now, going back, okay. With these sections, with the taxes, in, it would, because of the built in taxes and participation from the provinces, means we can now start issuing uh, vouchers, you know, like 70% discounts for people who were the original MMAR, real strong, you know, like heavily uh, disabled people under the MMAR program who real, most of them do lack the finances to afford what their medicines are. And under the MMBC MMAR card, we can actually have a, a situation where the person with their card looks and buys seventy dollars worth of bud, let's say, and but their price because of the card will mean they're only paying twenty dollars because the rest is subsidized in the taxes that were collected through the program. Okay, it, it, it's that's a real benefit right there. There the 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 tax. The, the credits for people with strong medical need are going to be built into the card. It's not something you're going to have. You're just going to go, total purchase, let's say $75. The guy puts his card in, and $25 is taken off the card. $75 is actually transacted. It's not as if the club lost all that money. No, no. The fund compensates the other 50% that was taken off. Okay, and, and that's all there is to it. it it's, it's a math thing. It happens automatically in the card. Now, the use of the card says that the cash was given to as a deposit to a computer. The computer actually made the sale. Uh, the Compassion Club is only doing a transaction, and there is no law against doing transactions, period. Okay, especially when it's providing the medical needs that were put on deposit with our system. Uh, we have a legal firm that represents common law, and the man is a, an expert, uh, actually all three partners are experts, at this program called Logenix. And it's the brains for our computer, okay, for our EDA and for our members. And uh, this program actually thinks Okay, it's run on a Linux computer. It a three hundred dollar laptop is all you need to run the entire province of BC. It's bulletproof. It's it's tamper proof. It's uh, extremely flexible. Now, the man who's programming our MM, BC MMAR program is the man who wrote OHIP. Ontario Health Insurance Program back in the 1970s after he got out of university. Okay, he's a very brilliant man, and he is setting up our BC MMAR program to be like OHIP. Okay, which means it's better than what Health Canada is offering. Period. Impossible for them to deny that what we're offering is better. Okay, and if you don't have that clause of better, uh, then uh, it, they might bust you and take you down, and that's all they do. Okay, now this computer uh, has program, uh, this Logenis computer program issues magnetic strips. Okay, and the magnetic strips is how we you can put a magnetic strip on every plant. You can put a magnetic strip on every light. You can and follow the plant through the uh, the hospital, which is the grow up. Okay. Technically, on the provider end, uh, it, he, he this guy who set up OPIP says it was all based on the bed, and in BC, in our case, the bed is a light. Okay, and the light has is in a ward that has so many babies in that ward. And since babies are small, they, there's a lot of them in that ward, okay? And then when it grows up, it's going to have few, you know, like it, it's still going to be in wards under that, okay? So basically, it's a way of tracking the plant through the system. You can track its nutrient flows, everything about it, 
Okay, the nutri you can do the lights, you can do the watering, you can do the whole maintenance, you can track the whole plant through the entire growth cycle. Okay, and at the end, crop it off. Okay, now the re on eight arm plants, you know, like on basically uh, the standard way of growing uh, an eight arm plant where you get eight uh, big honking clones and, or buds and uh, the rest is popcorn underneath, okay? Now, those eight arms are going to be, let's say it was uh, that magnetic strip will be cloned and all of a sudden it'll have eight magnetic strips going on all individual arms, okay? Now that bud is going to be marketed, okay? We put that in a in, in dry, you know, and put in a bag, okay? Now that to supply, under UCC terms and regulations, will we can't trim it before we put it in the bag. After we put it in the bag, we take it to a department that's called the trim department. They can open the bag and do the trim. Perfectly legal. Okay? But the grow up must first process the whole plant. Okay? And the magnetic strip follows along. Now, basically, you know, for bulk sales to compassion clubs who do their own trimming, uh, they'll buy the eight arms in one bag that's already pre dried And they'll sell that at a total weight of that bag is this much. Okay? Now, when they get to the, the, the clipping room, then they just trim, take out one bag. You can't do two bags at a time. Okay? You can't do it. Okay? It, 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 it'll screw up the math. The, the magnetic strip will object. Okay? So as long as you trim off and you have a pile over here of bud, a pile over here of trim, and a pile over here of branches that equal what was in the bag, then process it. That's all there is to it. Health Canada seems to think it's impossible to track what happens to all the different parts if you trim bud. And they're saying the solution make it illegal to trim bud. Well, you know what? In BC, the compassion clubs have been supplied with trim bud all these years. You know, for the last 12, 15 years in Vancouver, we've had compassion clubs provide trim bud. And we can carry on. But it's one department open. Okay? Now, in order to be compliant with the UCC, we're doing an education program and doing a marketing of untrimmed big buds. Okay, and sea of green, which is plants that are probably going to be about that big. Okay, instead of big honking buds that are this big. Okay, those big honking buds are going to be uh, 150, 200 bucks a pop. Okay, they're they're big. Okay, mind you, the sea of green ones are going to be about 30 to 50 dollars each. Okay, for the whole plant. But you know, that's a quarter to three quarters of an ounce. So the price of pot will be substantially less. Okay. Now, what we're doing there in order to educate people, we're going to have these on blister packs. Okay. And the blister packs are going to be highly artistic, you know, cards four inches wide. Okay. By 16 inches long. And with a card with decorative, you know, all sorts of filigree in this. And let's just say it's coming from the Kootenays. This will be Kootenai Purple Kush. And then over there, there'll be Island Purple Kush. And then, you know, over here, there'll be Texada Time Warp. It actually came from the island of Texada because it came from that co-op. Okay? And all of these blister packs are going to be having the buds. Okay? And people will be able to walk up, stick their... Uh, and this here can be done through vending machines. Our function here is to have vending machines for these blister packs of butt. So you'll walk into a dispensary and you'll be able to stick your card in there and if the bud's 120 bucks, just punch in, you know, M4, <laughs> card falls down, everyone's paid at the time because the card transfers all the funds. Okay? Now, at that time, you pull it out and you take it home and you do what you do with it. Now, the counter over there is going to have the same buds there 
except trimmed. Okay, so if you want to go see, before you buy it over there from a machine, on, or you can't smell it, touch it, feel it, you can go over there at the counter, like a Compassion Club, and say, can I see which one of the, you know, like, if I press for that one over there. Now, the reality is, is the bud there is going to be about the same price as the bud is today. The package over there is going to be substantially less expensive than the bud over there. Why? No work was put into it. Okay? And the education here is, is buying whole plant in prepackaged things, in prepackaged blister packs, at, is economical. And 75% of people in BC know how to trim a bud anyways. <laughs> it's not hard, okay? And then they can take the trim, and as I say, uh, some of that trim is hard to distinguish from being bud. And But you know what? You'll be able to make, uh, just like the Compassion Club, you'll be able to take your excess trim and make oil with it. Or do whatever you want with it. You do baking with it. Okay? I'll be selling cookbooks beside it. But, you know, basically, we're going to be offering trim bud from what's in these machines, uh, what we want as vending machines. Okay? These beautiful vendor strip where... There's a mechanism in the machine that reads the magnetic strip. So when that next package comes up, there it is, it'll be $42.50, and then the next bud that comes up, it'll be a different weight, might be $45.59, but you know what? That bun, you know, will be, it's a way of marketing pot where uh, it's a discount. Take my word for it, okay? Uh, it, people will learn through education that, you know, and people who want the trim bud, buy it over there. Okay, buy it over there. You're not being denied the right to sell bud or to buy bud that's already trimmed. But the incentive is going to be, you're probably going to save 15 to 20% if you buy it over there in that pack in, big, in, in a larger quantity. Because nobody had to trim it. Nobody had to do any labor for it. It's all, it's all built in. Okay? So we're working on much lower prices. Okay? And supplying a wide range of, of bud. Okay? Uh, we see having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of strains across four or five coolers. In every cooler, you can have 40, 50 strains. But, you know, in, in, in a vending machine. That's fully refrigerated, fully, you know, like, and you just stick your card in, press the number, down goes the pot, pick it up, take it home, enjoy. Okay? Now, that's an improvement. Okay? The big improvement is the grower gets to justify how many plants he has. He can justify that he, four to six months of production. Literally, he needs two, three crops of production. You know, they're not, but the mothers are there for the crops that are happening over there. The babies over there are eventually going to be in the next cycle and all of this. And they'll be able to justify all kinds of plants because uh, they have a known need uh, from compassion clubs. And this paperwork should be sufficient to stop any investigation or any charges being pressed against the legitimate suppliers to legitimate compassion clubs, which is very much threatened right now. Okay? Under the MMPR program, the, these guys are going to disappear. Okay? A whole bunch of legitimate suppliers are going to disappear for lack of paperwork, lack of having done their homework to protect themselves. Okay? All these growers who supply to legitimate Compassion Club sources or quasi-legal sources, because there's all kinds of them throughout the provinces that are operating, and the police know it, everybody knows it, and everything like this. But, you know, those those Compassion Clubs, and I could name off a few, but I don't want to draw heat on them, but they could actually start giving licenses to them. And the local police would go, oh, yeah, we know him. Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, we, your, your crop's safe. Okay? And basically what we're doing is, at the grower end, we're sending them notices, courtesy notices, to the effect that 
we are setting ourselves up under the BC MMAR program. It's better books. It's better run. It's uh, what we, the people, consent to be governed under. And uh, take our chances that the BC Supreme Courts are not going to want to give away the power that we're offering them by taking the MMAR program back. Now, the reality is, is what we're offering to the city is a, a legitimate ways and means to have medical access to marijuana provided to any adult in BC. Okay? It's, it's that simple, okay? We'll never drive out all the criminals, but we could legitimately have 20,000 lights, as my paperwork says. 20,000 lights in operation. And that would be a very good day. And on this, uh, this should be enough on this video. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, the program we're doing is uh, cutting a brave new world. And uh, it has to be done because uh, Health Canada is threatening uh, the peace, welfare, and health of uh, tens of thousands of Canadians. In BC alone, 50,000. Okay? We could easily have a membership of 50,000 people in three weeks to a month, a month and a half. It's, uh, and with numbers like that, courts are not going to trample your rights. Okay? It's just not going to happen. Especially when we're offering them the ways and means to, uh, uh, gain back the powers that they lost. And we're actually offering them revenue with our party sales tax. Okay, and just built it right into the computer where X number of percent goes here, X number of percent goes here, X number of percent goes here. X. All of these things can be worked out, negotiated, and implemented and uh, in very short order. It falls right in with Sensible BC, which is there to, uh, and which does not address uh, the, the suppliers. Okay, there's no protection for suppliers under Sensible BC that I can see. Uh, my program works in conjunction with them because 90% of all the people who Sensible BC is trying to protect would become legitimate members. Uh, bottom line, each EDA can do whatever they want. My electoral district is pursuing uh, uh, several facets in order to drive this through. Other EDAs can do whatever they want. It's uh, a brave new world. And on that, Thank you very much.